This program has been made possible by a generous grant from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Program, conserving our fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all Vermonters to enjoy. Next on Outdoor Journal. Oh, it's a brookie! We visit a camp in the Northeast Kingdom where teens are immersed in the world of fly fishing. Then we enjoy some spills and thrills during a paddleboard lesson on Lake Champlain. We take a look at the habitat work being done at the Steam Mill Brook Wildlife Management Area. And a threatened species of turtle is getting a helping hand thanks to a special Adopt-a-Turtle program. Vermont has dozens of summer camps that introduce kids to the great outdoors. But until recently, no camp focused on the lifelong sport of fly fishing. That changed in 2011 when the Mad Dog chapter of Trout Unlimited created a special fly fishing camp just for teens. Today, Trout Camp is spawning a new generation of enthusiastic fly fishermen and women. Here we go, rod tip up, rod tip up. These kids have the passion before they get here. Oh, it's a brookie! All right! They're not being sent here, they want to be here. Look at that beautiful fish you caught on the drive-by, Alec. Nice job! Oh, there we yep. go! There we go! There's 20 other camps uh, that TU has uh, throughout the country. And uh, we thought, why in the world doesn't Vermont have a, uh, have a camp with all the wonderful places we have to fish? And so four or five of us got together and started trying to plan this trout camp from, uh, from scratch. After a great deal of planning, the Mad Dog chapter of Trout Unlimited hosted its first fly fishing camp for teens in 2011. The headquarters for the five-day, four-night camp is Quimby Country Lodge and Cottages in the town of Averill, which is nestled deep in the north woods of the Northeast Kingdom. Quimby Country is Vermont's oldest sporting camp, and it sits on the shores of Forest Lake. Quimby's has been around since 1894, and it started out as a fly fishing lodge, and I was showing some of the kids the, uh, the fly fishing photo albums from the turn of the century, and we were looking at big stringers of brook trout and giant lake trout and unbelievable five, six, seven, eight pound uh, salmon and to give them a sense of the history here at Quimby's and uh, show them that uh, this place has been hosting people with the same interests in, in fly fishing for, for a very, very long time. The location is beautiful. You won't be surprised to see moose. Um, Quimby has loons and you go to sleep with the loons calling. It's one of my favorite things. <laughs> Birds here are great. I mean, just being in this kind of environment is a lot of fun. Nice fish, Jake. Thanks. Well, we've been having a blast out here. These brook trout have been taking uh, sulfurs, and these guys are able to get into uh, a ton of fish. Um, you know, these guys are great anglers. They were, uh, they're really came, they really came to us with a lot of skills, and they're getting better, and they're having a lot of fun. A what lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, let's, uh, let's release that guy. All let's right. get him in the net, see how he's doing. Trout Camp is for boys and girls ages 13 to 16 who are interested in learning to fly fish or improving their techniques. Campers get to spend time fishing and honing their skills each day, but there's more to Trout Camp than just learning how to cast a fly or catch fish. And so you'd uh, open it up with a spade, shove it down in about six inches or so, cover it back up, and it's just a very simple, easy, cost-effective way of uh, getting natural trees from the habitat that you're in. Planting willow whips to improve the riparian habitat along streams is just one of many conservation lessons taught during the week. The campers also learn about fish biology, fish habitat, stream ecology, and aquatic entomology. Each morning, hands-on demonstrations are held in the field that are led by volunteer instructors. 
<laughs> hey, there's something moving. That's a caddis fly, actually. In addition to exposing them to something that's a lot of fun and uh, that they can uh, utilize for the rest of their life. Whoa, look at the size of that dude. Um, it really sets a foundation uh, for the conservation movement and the continuation of the conservation movement. Um, these young people are going to be the, the folks that are going to be making decisions down the road as to how we utilize our, our rivers and streams and, and our, our woodlands. So the opportunity to see some of the important things that go on beyond the rod and the reel uh, is really important. I learned like the flies really cool and how some of them are predators. I didn't really expect to see flies being predators, like the stone fly and the Helgramite. Yeah, I liked flipping the rocks over and doing the entomology and doing the kick nets. I was a bit surprised on how many flies there are and I was really kind of shocked that yesterday making us come out here in the rain and the cold water, I thought we were going to go in because it was like pouring, but no, no, we stayed out here. I was glad because I caught two fish. When I'm fishing, I don't want to stop. And so even if it's bad weather, I'm, I'm still going to be out there. And I think everybody took that bad weather really well. A lot of the fishing is done on the upper Connecticut River, which is one of New England's finest trout waters and is home to brook, brown, and rainbow trout. When the rain finally quit, the surface of the river came alive with hatching insects. There you go. There you go, fish on. Suddenly, every camper began hooking fish. This is um, a mayfly. Um, it's an aquatic insect. These are hatching right now, and these are the things that are making the fishing right now so good. Oh, there he is! One of the best things about Trout Camp is there are more guides and experts on hand than students. That's a nice man. Okay. We're doing one-on-one -on -one instruction with them. At all times, if the kids have an adult with them, if they have any question that that particular adult can't answer, they will find the person who is the expert in that particular field, and they will get the answers for them. Another man. As soon as you see that line start getting pulled downstream, there you go. Oh! oh. <laughs> There's more where that came from. The guys that are taking us out are really good people. They're really knowledgeable about the sport. Oh, there you go. Nice, nice. Nice brook trout. It's a way to get out to nature and it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. That's good, that's good. Nice, nice. They're yeah. great. They, they show you all the perfect spots. Whenever I cast, he always tells me, oh, that was a good cast. And, I'll cast it again. Oh, that was even better. It makes me feel really good. Good one. Good one. They're really funny, too. All right, Alec, doing work. Yeah. From the moment campers arrive, each day is filled with conservation activities and hands-on instruction in all aspects of fly fishing, including tying flies. But like all camps, there is still time for the campers to just be kids. We all have our moments of being weird and crazy and loud, but I have two best parts. One of them was catching the fish, and the other part, I held a ping pong tournament the other night. So that was pretty fun. All of these kids are great kids. I mean, their personalities, as different as each of them are, they're just wonderful in the way they sink together. Um, you know, the first couple days, it's, you know, they're kind of feeling the waters, and then and then you see them now, and kids you never thought would have connected are connecting and having a great time. It was a great group of kids. It's really nice to uh, know that there are people out there that like what you like, too. So um, I really bonded with all the kids and had a lot of fun. At the end of the week, families are treated to a barbecue lunch, after which the campers and their guides share some of their favorite moments of the week. Fly fishermen, our, our dream is to have a season where our waders never get dry, her hair will never get dry. <laughs> she'll, she'll fish in anything. <laughs> Each camper leaves with more than just new skills and new friends. Thanks to generous donations by corporate sponsors, each student leaves equipped to pursue a new lifetime sport. You bring home a lot of stuff, that's for sure. You get a lot of equipment. You know, you get the flies, you get the tippet. It's awesome. With room for only about a dozen or so students each year, it doesn't take long for Trout Camp to fill up. Applications can be found online at vermonttroutcamp.com.
Organizers know they are doing something right when they hear campers say they want to return. But what they like to hear most are the fish stories that occur after campers leave. We stay in contact with the kids after the fact, you know, through Facebook and, and emails or blog posts, things like that, and we hear the fish stories. And, you know, that's what we want. We want them to, to leave here and continue fishing. Everywhere we live, we have rivers that have fish in them, and we can go catch them. <laughs> it's, just, it's fun. I like it. I know how to do it. I can just fish. It's a labor of love. <laughs> You know, we look towards the, you know, the future of the fisheries and conserving the waters. And this is the next generation. These are the ones that, uh, that have to carry the torch. It's the best camp I've ever been to because it's a lot of fun and I'm doing what I love most, which is fly fishing. <laughs> I'm absolutely going to continue to fly fish. Lake Champlain has long been known for its spectacular views and for providing endless outdoor activity options. But there's a new sport that's riding the wave of popularity. And although Vermont is 5,000 miles away from Hawaii, the aloha mentality seems a lot closer with the new trend of supping. Supping is stand-up paddleboarding. Okay. So it's the, the acronym for this growing sport. It's a blend of kayaking, canoeing, and surfing. It can be a great workout or just a peaceful way to enjoy the lake. At the Community Sailing Center in Burlington, anyone can rent out the necessary equipment to try out supping. Stand-up paddleboarding is a great way to experience the lake. Uh, number one, that it's easy. You can come down and with five minutes know the basics of paddling and get out on the lake right away. I mean, and if it hits a little bit, it's fine because the buoyancy is going to keep it from really smashing. The other thing is that it's portable. If you own your own paddleboard, you really can take it anywhere. And then just kind of do a couple paddles to get yourself backwards. The concept is simple enough, so I put my surfer dreams to the test. After a quick lesson, of course. So when you're standing up, you're going to get a nice wide stance and make sure that you're always holding on to the paddle. You're going to feel a little bit of wobbling. And it's natural, it's a, it's a muscle thing. It takes about a minute or a minute and a half, and then after that minute and a half, your legs are gonna start getting used to the feeling. Okay, so it's uh, gonna take me only one minute to learn how to do this. I, I've had people actually <laughs> feel it happen okay. after about a minute. We'll see. So you're standing on a board, you have a paddle like a kayak, and your stance is that you are pushing the paddle through the water so that you're essentially, some people say, standing on water. Paddling while kneeling gets you familiar with the strokes. Once you feel comfortable, it's time to stand up. And so you're just gonna get a nice wide stance and just pop up and then you're standing. So there is a chance that you fall in. Just try to keep your feet wide and stay calm. I'm calm, yeah. I'm calm. Woo! Nice. I'm up. Good job. <laughs> Finding your center of balance comes quickly. One tip I soon learned, <laughs> never look down. Try to not look at the board too much. So how do I turn? The same way as when you're kneeling, get a nice wide Woo! stance. Woo! Woo! So try, yeah. If at any time you don't feel comfortable, you just kneel back down. And unlike surfing, calm water is best at least for paddle boarding rookies like me. Lake Champlain isn't an ocean, but you get decent enough waves out here. Feels a little bit like an ocean today. <laughs> the wind a, is definitely... Yeah, that's a little gust ah! right there. You may ah! want to... Oh. Ah! How's that feel? <laughs> Sorry about that. Got the yeah, that picked up. It's a lot harder when you're paddling to fight with the wind and there really is no, no fight. It was a battle I did not win, as you can see. 
But with each time up, your confidence grows along with your paddleboarding skills. Pretty fun. We are teaching people to be future stewards of the lake. And our belief is that you can't take care of something you don't love and you can't love something unless you experience it. A new way to play on the water that's not only fun, but a learning experience about yourself. But you can feel, you really get the hang of it quick. The people with you in the lake. Steam Mill Wildlife Management Area is the second largest wildlife management area in the state. It's about roughly 10,800 acres. Since it's such a large WMA and primarily in a, in a big contiguous block, it encompasses a lot of different habitat types. There's a, a good diversity of northern hardwood forests and also um, sort of boreal spruce fir type forest habitats. Steam Mill Brook Wildlife Management Area is located in the southwestern corner of the Northeast Kingdom. Most of the WMA is in the towns of Walden, Stannard, and Wheelock in Caledonia County, with part of the track spilling over into the adjoining town of Danville. At one time there were six lumber mills there. Um, it was sort of a thriving economic area. Some evidence of those sites still remain on the area, um, and just in the form of foundation and old mill sites. The small communities that developed around the mills have disappeared. Almost all that remains from the old homesteads are a handful of openings in the forest. These small fields are now actively hayed thanks to lease agreements with local farmers. Delayed mowing practices are used so grassland birds can complete their nesting cycles. The agricultural fields in this really heavily forested landscape are sort of a unique feature. They, they provide openings for raptors to feed on small mammals such as mice and voles and um, they allow foxes to feed there and many different predators will feed on the small mammals in those fields but then they also provide forage in the form of clover and various grasses so it's a unique opening where you have you know thousands of acres of forest land and just you know 30 or 40 acres of grassland almost everything sort of is drawn to those areas a lot of old wild apple trees are also found on Steam Mill Brook WMA. Thanks to active management, many of these old apples have been freed from competing trees and are now bearing plenty of fruit. What we're looking at right here is one of my favorite habitat management techniques, uh, which is we've girdled um, this spruce tree, which causes it to slowly die. And as it does so, um, it allows more sunlight to filter through its branches, which allows this apple tree over here next to it to live. And apples need sunlight, and eventually they become shaded out and they die. So uh, we are favoring, obviously, the, the food provided by the apple trees for wildlife over this spruce tree. But this technique works great because as the spruce tree slowly dies, um, it just sort of slowly disintegrates. It provides a perch and denning sites for various species of wildlife at the same time um, that it's decaying. Now this area will be attractive to black bear, deer, wild turkey, rough grouse, even porcupines, which love apples. So we've turned it sort of from an unproductive area to a much more productive area from a wildlife standpoint. Other foods like choke cherries, raspberries, and nut producing trees like beech attract all sorts of wildlife. The WMA provides an assortment of hunting opportunities, including deer, turkey, and upland birds. Because of its large size and relative lack of roads, snowshoe hare and black bear hunting are also popular, especially among houndsmen. Steam Mill Brook itself offers some backwoods brook trout fishing, and there are many other opportunities to enjoy wildlife and commune with nature on the WMA. To encourage multiple day use, the area includes a small but easily accessible campsite. Steam Mill Brook area is one of the WMAs where uh, camping is allowed in the fall during hunting seasons. Um, and if you uh, look at our map on the Fish and Wildlife Department website, there it shows where the designated area is. And it provides sort of a unique experience um, as long as their unit's self-contained. Um, they can use that as a base camp for deer hunting or upland hunting or bear hunting or that sort of thing. And there's only a limited number of WMAs that are large enough to provide that opportunity. Among the tremendous diversity of wetlands and uplands, there's something for everyone. Whether you enjoy hunting, berry picking, or wildlife viewing, 
If you like to get off the beaten path, then Steam Mill Brook Wildlife Management Area is a great place to visit. I guess these guys are the star of the show, huh? Turtles. Turtles. I love turtles! Alright, who's our first volunteer? Sonneborn family. Sonneborns? Since 2007, a group of turtle-loving families have gathered along the shore of Lake Champlain to give a group of baby turtles a new lease on life. These turtle saviors are part of the Head Start program, created by a partnership between the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and the Echo Science Center. Well, Echo's purpose is to really teach about the stewardship and caring about our Lake Champlain. Today is an example of bringing the stewardship message full circle where we have uh, families and people adopting a turtle, spiny softshell turtle, um, learning about it over the time that it's at Echo for the winter months, and then coming to the very area where it normally would have hatched and been free, but bringing it here for the first time to be free in Lake Champlain, where it's a little stronger, a little healthier, has a better chance of survival. Money raised through the adoption process helps cover the cost of caring for the turtles during a 10-month growing period. Anyone can adopt a turtle. We wrote a paper and we like told it to the whole brownie troop. And so we raised enough money so we could adopt like a soft shell turtle. In addition to over 40 spiny soft shell turtles, a few dozen map turtles will also be released. Let's face it, he's even smaller than an Oreo. What happens to Oreos? They're snacks. Steve Perrin, the Wildlife Diversity Program Director for the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, rescued these turtles during the previous fall. Saving these turtles is critical. With an estimation of less than 300 adult spiny softshell turtles in Lake Champlain, the species has been listed as threatened in Vermont since 1987. The two biggest threats to the turtle population are loss of nesting habitat along undisturbed gravel beaches and predation. Before we had so much of the shoreline developed for people, beaches would come and go, you have a flood, a new deposit of gravel or sand, and the turtles would follow those. Now you've got seawalls and riprap and docks and infrastructure that prevents that from moving around. So I've got these few really incredibly important sites. And so I'm trying to mimic what nature would do in sort of an artificial way. I'm keeping them clear of vegetation, making sure they're sunlit. And then the other important piece is I've got all these predators that are very abundant along the shores of Lake Champlain. In mid-July, after the turtles have laid their eggs, the nesting sites are covered with a wire mesh that's one inch by two inch mesh. And a baby turtle that hatches out and comes to the surface can go through that mesh. But a skunk or a raccoon trying to dig through it, it's not gonna be worth his time. Even with all of these precautions, these half dollar sized creatures are vulnerable to everything from great blue herons to bass and bullfrogs. With only 2% maturing to the breeding age of 12 years old, Echo's adoption program is giving a handful of turtles a head start to increase their odds of survival. Bye. Look, do you see them in there? So there are over 20 families here today releasing what they believe are their turtles. Pretty cute. <laughs> it tickles. To me, that really is a stewardship message in a nutshell, because the children learn especially that they start to care about an animal because they adopted it. They go to Echo and visit it over and over again because they're members and they want to see how it's doing. And then they learn that you need to let it be free. You need to let it go. So even though it's interesting to have a fish in a bowl or a turtle in an aquarium or something like that at home, really they belong in the wild. And really, once they're in the wild, what can you do to make sure that where they live is protected and safe and the water is clean? Good luck, Good luck. Yeah, I got a picture of it. Is he going to go back out? Oh, there he goes. He's coming back. He's coming back. What we did today was try to bend the curve a little bit in their favor so that we would have more turtles living longer in that younger, more vulnerable age class. Once they get larger, there's really not a lot 
that's going to go wrong. Do you want to just let him swim off your hand? Oh, you have He's going to think about it for a minute. Oh, mine's ready to go. <laughs> From a biological standpoint, there are no other turtles uh, here in Vermont that have soft shells. All other turtles have big, heavy armored shells. These guys have a piece of shoe leather for a shell, which is very unique. Can you breathe in air? Yep, turtles breathe air just like us. This innovative project not only educates the community about these fascinating creatures, it also helps children and adults make a connection to the lake's ecosystem. It's all part of our natural heritage. We belong here, but so do they, you know, and I think we can share the planet and I think we owe it to the rest of life to honor them and to sure. allow the natural world to continue. Good. Yay! Good job, Dean! For more information on this or any other Outdoor Journal segment, be sure to visit our website at vpt.org slash outdoorjournal. Our site features video on demand, as well as links to related sites. You can call, write, or email us, and as always, we look forward to your comments and suggestions.